Hey guys, just before we get into the episode, I wanted to remind you that you can find me on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also find the Maladjusted Monkeys podcast on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram as well. So go over and support the guys and show some love. This episode is going to kickstart what is going to be called the Rifles and Sirens podcast uh, or segment on, on the Man K4301 podcast. It's just talking to ex-military, current military and EMS workers about their time and service, the trials and tribulations that they face uh, on a day-to-day basis, how they develop PTSD, depression, what triggers that sort of stuff in their profession and how they deal with the problems afterwards and uh, we're really hoping that these episodes and people that are uh, giving this information reaching out can help others in identifying certain issues that they might be having themselves so that they can start getting the help that they really need and also to give each other the tools um, in dealing with these issues as well so you might not relate uh, entirely with their story but you may relate to somebody else's so that's why we've got more people coming on uh, in the future so if you or your uh, a friend of yours has a story that they would like to share uh, or share their experiences in those fields please don't hesitate to contact me at mank4301 at gmail.com. Ultimately, you can go to Facebook and send me a message on there and also Instagram. So without further ado, let's get into the podcast. I'm Tommy. I'm Shane. We're the Maladjusted Monkeys. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Man K4301 podcast. I'm your host, Big Kev. I'm here with Tommy and Shane from the Maladjusted Monkeys. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. Mate, thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it. How would you like to do this? Do you want to do two episodes, one for each, or did you want to... Mate, we can... I'm Up to you, to, man. Yeah, I'm happy to this. just splice it all in. Like Our stories are very the same, so yeah. You know, yeah. we did everything pretty much together, so yeah. All right, let's give this a batch. All right, so we'll start off with the, the, the question that starts off every podcast. Why did you join the military? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, well, for me, uh, I grew up and I always... It was two things for me that I was going to do ever since I was a kid, either be a police officer or be a soldier. And after I left high school, I think I went, right, I'm going to try to join the coppers. Uh, and at the time, you needed a tertiary education, you go to uni and stuff. And there was a bit that said on the website, but if you're ex-military... Then we'll waive that and you can come on in. And I went, right, oh, well, I may as well just go join the uh, the infantry, do my time in the army, then join the coppers. Uh, so that's what I did. And, um, yeah, haven't looked back since. That's basically what I'm doing now. I'm in the coppers now. did four years in the uh, Australian infantry and I'm five years in the police now. So, yeah, that's why I joined it. I was always going to be either a cop or a soldier. Luckily, I got to do both. Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it wasn't just a stepping stone. You, it was something you were... A- Fairly interested in. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, yeah, from about age of eight, I always wanted to be in the army and be a police officer. And yeah, I'm just lucky enough to be able to do have done both now. Yeah, nice. Um, so I got a pretty strong um, family background in the military. So, um, like on both sides, um, grandparents who served in uh, World War One, um, World War Two. My grandfather was in Vietnam, so I kind of just grew up with it and. I just always wanted to be yeah, looking at who my grandfather was. He was a pretty big role model for me, so I always wanted to uh, join the join the army, especially the infantry, because that's what he was. Uh, despite his uh, <laughs> advice that that probably wasn't the best career choice, so yeah, it worked out in the end though. So he was he the only one that was against it, or oh no, he like he he, he was pretty keen for me to join the army. Just uh, he thought I could do better than the infantry. <laughs> yeah. Infantry or nothing, right? Yeah, Infantry yeah. or nothing, mate. That's, <laughs> that's what I set out with, yeah. <laughs> nice. So where do you sign up? Is, uh... um, so 
I think I, pretty much it was all done over the phone. So I just I did like a very cursory uh, bit of research on the internet about or on the army site what was what was the go, and then call them up, make your appointment to um, go to Defence Force Recruiting um, Centre, and you go there, do I don't know what they call it now. I think it was called Joe's Day. Yeah, yeah. And Joe's you Day. do your um, aptitude testing. You talk to a, a career advisor and a psych yep. and different things. So. Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty easy process. Yeah, nice. Uh, so you you join up and whereabouts do they send you? Uh, when once you join up, you go do your basic training at uh, Kapuka and Wagga Wagga, and that's is that twelve weeks. Twelve weeks. Yeah, twelve weeks where you learn just basic soldiering skills. So basic um, how to use a rifle, how to do drill, how basically how to carry yourself like a soldier. Basic field field skills. Um, and so it's 12 weeks of basic training and then after that uh, everyone heads off to um, their employment training so uh, for me and Shane because we joined the infantry after our 12 weeks of basic training we head head off to uh, the school of infantry in Singleton also known as the school of cool <laughs> and that's where we learn how to be uh, a rifleman basically and how long is that that's that's a, another 12 weeks. Is that 12 weeks? Yeah, 12 weeks of learning um, infantry skills okay so a lot more weapons and tactics um, and after that yeah you head to your battalion so for me, six R A R for Shane, six R six R as well at uh, Anogra in Brisbane. Nice. Yeah. Is basic training really that basic, or is it the typical screaming as you get off the bus and? Oh yeah, all yeah, that sort of yeah. stuff. There's lots of um, there's just lots of screaming and um, it's just jarring because it's you're not used to it. Um, but really, it it really is quite basic because like a lot of the stuff you're learning is just, like just how to look after yourself as a human being. So, like, there's guys there who never mopped or swept a floor before, didn't know how to clean a toilet or anything like that. So You have, it, a, you have a lesson on shaving the first yeah, night, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Given really? to, I remember in my, my platoon, it was given by a female instructor. She put the what? shaving cream on. And <laughs> I was like, this chick is hard as nails. <laughs> and, like, did that. And I think they, they give you a lesson on, like, how to shower yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah, like, so it is. How to iron your uniform. How to iron your uniform. So Make it is basic bed. skills. So basic training is Basic stuff. Yeah, like, well, they, you know, you got to remember they're smashing skill. you down to the lowest common denominator to rebuild you again. I yeah. remember when I got off the bus, it felt like it, like the classic scene from the movie. It was pissing down with rain, <laughs> and they're just yelling at us to get off this bus, and you're standing there all formed up, you know, in your civvies, not knowing what's going on. I think that first night when I went to bed, I was like, man, I have made a big <laughs> mistake here. I was like, is this really what I want to yeah. do? But then you get you get used to the yelling because you, you know it's a game. At the end of it, you know, they'll yell at you for anything, even though you're not really messing up. They're, yeah. they're going to yell at you and break you down and rebuild you to, you know, think the way you need to think as a soldier. Yep. Yeah. And then when you go to the School of Infantry, it, it happens again. All right, you've learnt the basic skills. We're going to break you down again, mm. and now we're going to teach you how to be an infantry soldier. Yeah. And knock the basic stuff out. And then... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And build on it as well. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, it's... When once a when a civilian goes to Kapuka and learns the basic training, I think if you ask a civilian who's halfway through training, how basic is it or what's it like, they'll say, "Oh, this is full on. This yeah. is you know the hardest thing I've ever done." When you ask an infantry soldier once he's finished, you know Singleton or even if he's at the School of Infantry, what was basic training like? They'll go, "Man, that was a breeze. That was nothing compared yeah. to this." And then same thing, you ask soldiers at battalion and they laugh at. Like Wagga Wagga Kapuki, you're like, yeah, that was that was the easiest thing you've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> slowly graduated, like going up through those those steps. And it's the same for like Cav and other um combat roles and things yeah. like that. They have a much similar experience. Like I remember uh we were marching down to PT or something and I was in the back right hand um of the file marching down and uh I was uh, what's called square gating. So instead of swinging my arms alternate, alternatively with my legs, <laughs> my left arm was swinging with my left leg, my right arm was swinging with my legs. It's called square gating. <laughs> and my sergeant was just beasting me, like, stop fucking square gating. Sorry, do you mind if we swear? Go or? for it, man. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just getting into me. So I was, what did he tell me? He's like, stop swinging your arms. Okay, now swing around. I kept square gating. He's like, "Do you even know what fucking square gating is?" I'm like, "No, sergeant." He's like, "Oh shit, that's right. You're a new course. Yeah, it's this." And then like, yeah. So for them, because they just pump out people uh, courses one after another. So for them, it's a fucking blur as well. And yeah. that's the thing. Like, it's just marching is just walking. 
but when you get to the army, you forget how to walk, and then you do this thing, yeah, like Shane said, called square gating. You're like, it's like you're one of those Thunderbird puppets on a string, and it makes no sense. I remember the first night when, yeah, they were basically teaching us how to march, um, and I was in the front row, and I remember Corporal Brendan Hope, he listens to our show, actually, so he'll enjoy this. I remember he got right in my face. He's like, it's not a fucking runway, sunshine. I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Isn't it, I'm, like, I'm just walking, aren't I? <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> were were there any people in there that just just didn't get it? Like yeah. some, some shirt fillers, as we like to call yeah, them. Oh yeah. yeah, I specifically remember a bloke who probably day two or three he must have realised this wasn't for him, and he his whole family was in in the army. I remember, and because because once you're there, you can't it's, you can't just put your hand up and say I quit and that's it. I think yeah. they've got you for how long? You got to do the whole course, don't you? Can you remember? Uh, you're in for four years. Yeah, oh, you're in for four years. So you can't just wow. say, this isn't for me. They're like, no, you've signed for four years, so we will have you for four years unless something drastic happens. Wow. And I remember or he, you're under 18, then your parents can yeah. remove you. And I remember he must have realised, yep, this is definitely not for me. So he started making up a story about uh, his family members being sick and things like that and just expected that no one would follow, follow up on it. <laughs> he even got one of my mates to help write a letter to the commanding officer of why he should, you know, um, why he should be allowed to leave and got him to write, you know, my, I think, you know, family members got cancer, dad's sick. This guy went dying. to lengths. Went to yeah. lengths, right? And we all believed him. So I remember believing him. And then I remember a few days after he wrote the letter, we were out having, must be one of our first weapons drills um, out in the scrub. And, <laughs> and I don't think I've told you this story. And a vehicle pulled up. Uh, and it was like the military police with uh, our sergeant, our platoon sergeant, and they've called old mate out and got all of us to line up, and they just beasted this boy. They're like, take a good hard look at this guy, man. And we're like, what is going on? They're like, he stated his family sick, said this, this, and this. It's all bullshit. He doesn't deserve to wear this uniform. He doesn't deserve to be around here. Take a good hard look at him. You'll never see him again. All of a sudden, he just bolted. Into the oh, scrub. <laughs> he bolted into the scrub. I don't know where he was going, but he bolted in the scrub. And I remember the sergeant looked at uh, the two corporals and he just went, get him. So they sprinted oh. off and we're standing there and he's like, it was like watching like um, two greyhounds after like a really slow rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> and one was on the left, one was on the right. And I remember he was running and he looked back and he's like, you can't touch me. And one went high, one went low and boom, oh. straight to the ground. And we never saw him again. Yeah, that was it. So I don't know how I don't know how his movie ended, but um, who knows what he's doing now? It obviously wasn't well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Holy shit! So yeah, you're gonna get guys like that. I, did you have any guys in your platoon at basic like that? Yeah, but they all end up going off to their chosen jobs, and yeah, you know, I don't know. Maybe they came good in the end. Like some some people it takes a little bit longer to um, integrate into that. Um, Culture, culture, yeah. yeah. It, it can take some people a little bit of time, and then after that, once you adjust to it, it becomes normal everyday life. Um, other people just, you know, for whatever reason, just adapt to it really quickly, and yeah, yeah. It, uh, some people that we get uh, just, y yeah, like that, that basic training, mm. like it's just, just the, like the little things that people just don't get, yeah, you know, uh, and and they never will. Yeah, mm. with genetics, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think you're going to get that in any job, really. Um, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it just with the military, it's it stands out so much more because it is such a culture shock and it's a change. Like, it's not normal behaviour. Like the way you no. taught at basic training, like you you are relearning every little thing about you, and everyone you're basically starting off on an even playing field. It's like this is the type of person you will be at basic training, so you'll all be like that. Mm. And if you can't conform to that. It stands out, yeah. Like old mate who tried running away into the scrub. Like, I don't know where he was going. I remember there was another bloke, actually, who left in the middle of the night. It, it, again, definitely wasn't for him. And he was uh, he was a strange one. He packed all his bags. Somehow he got past everyone and walked to the front gate, which is miles away from where we were, and said, oh, oh do you mind calling me a cab so I can go home? And they're like, yeah, no worries. They just called the MP. <laughs> <laughs> they came pick you up, brought him straight back. <laughs> so while, while I was at TSP uh, training support platoon at um, uh, at Singo, we um, we had a guy who had done the runner, got on, gotten away, and um, the story that we were told was that it'd been a few months, and they were trying to find him, couldn't find him. They were pretty sure he's at his mum's place, and she denied that he was there. So eventually, they just sent, sent <laughs> him. Um, 
sent him a, a letter to his mother saying, look, can you just get him to sign these papers so we can discharge him from the army, rah, 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 rah. And uh, I think she called him up and said, oh, yeah, yeah, sweet, just send him here, he's here, rah, rah, rah. So oh, then, that, that, then yeah. just rocked up. Because <laughs> I remember they pulled up with him and they threw him in the cells for a couple of days and then as soon as they let him out of the cells to join back in with the platoon, he was gone that night, like, just run off again. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Fugitive from the army. <laughs> yeah. We've all thought about it. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> you think about it. I remember when we were at the School of Infantry, like you'd get smashed all week, but you had your weekends off. So it's common for everyone to go to Newcastle um, on your weekends. And, you, you know, you've got disposable income, your early 20s, hanging out with your mates, you've done hard training all week, and then you've got the run of Newcastle mm. to yourself for a whole weekend, drinking alcohol all weekend. Then it comes to that Sunday because you've got to be back Sunday night. Sunday Arvo, you're sitting there thinking, you're normally sitting in a bar going, <laughs> you know, it'd be easy to just stay here and not yeah. go back. You know, uh, you do it every weekend. I used to think that, but I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was actually one of the questions that I was going to ask is, was there at any time that you regretted what you were doing? <sighs> but it seems that I, like, th there was a little bit of regret at different intervals. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> not so much. I don't think it's regret so much as um, just, I guess, constantly question like, is this worth it? Is this what, really what I want to do? Um, when do you sort of start seeing it pay off? Probably after a couple of years, you meet your battalion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, ta it takes a little while. Uh, um, anyone listening who's gone through training, just stay with it. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get there. Yeah, eventually. It's. I reckon defining moment for me anyway, I'd say you'd be the same, Shane, is when you get Don't the green light. <laughs> Don't talk to me. That green light for a deployment. Once you get told you're going overseas, then you go, well, this is what I've trained for. Yeah. You know, and then when you get boots on the ground, you're like, yeah, this is worth it. You know, the three, four years I've been training and getting smashed. Yeah, it's worth it. I think it it's even for that. Like once you get posted to, to your your unit after you've finished all your training and you start to develop those relationships and close bonds with people in your unit. Um, that's when like a lot of the stuff that you worried about before just becomes water, water off the docks back because your support network's um, even bigger. Mm -hmm. You're learning more about the organization. You're getting more confident in your own skills and things like that. Um, you also built that brotherhood as well. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. you've been through it all together and yeah. yeah. Well, that's, it's an interesting thing because once you get to your battalion, you start going doing field exercises and um, uh, doing real tough exercises where you're out field for two, three weeks in the scrub, even though you're over it. And like, that's the thing with uh, with soldiers. Like we can be in the worst situation. We're going to complain nonstop about it, <laughs> but the, we're still going to do the that's job. That's the diggers, right? That's yeah, exactly. We're going to complain the whole time, but we'll get the job done. <laughs> and no matter how bad it is out field, like I think me and Shane have spoke about this before. Like we'd see each other out scrub and. All we do is just start making fun of each other yeah. and trying to bring each other's morale down. But we're actually lifting it yeah, by making yeah. fun of each other. And that's what makes it worth it. Like, you wouldn't change a thing. Nah. Even though it's shit conditions, you're out there yeah. with your brothers and it makes it worth it, yeah. Well, that's the thing too. Like, uh, you, you you tend to see that people in the military, they, they make the best out of a bad situation. Yeah, yeah. we because have to. Otherwise, you just go mad. Yeah. Mm. And that's where like a digger's sense of humour comes into play, like the dark yeah, sense of humor. dark. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's real dark, but that's the way it has to be because is it darker than your coffee? And that's pretty dark. <laughs> that's pretty, that's dark. pretty dark. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say it'd be on par, if not darker. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good segue actually to um, to getting your assignments and deployments and all that sort of stuff. So you're in six RAR. When's the first time that you get deployed? So we, uh, we got there t 2010. You got there late 2009. To the battalion? Yeah. Uh, early 2010. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so it wasn't until 2000, start of 2012 that we first got rumblings that um, they were going to take uh, drivers and crew commanders um, for the Bushmasters uh, to deploy with 3 RAR. So we didn't actually go with our unit. Um, and then slowly lists start to form on who's going on the trip lists change people get cut people get put back on um classic nothing ever goes to plan no, yeah, yeah exactly um you don't feel safe till you're over there yeah, basically. yeah. like poor old, poor old Curto, one of our best mates um i think hands down would probably be the best one, one of the best soldiers we've ever met yeah. um was meant to be on a uh going over on a different kind of trip to us but at the same time with um 
Were they special? Was it a special? Yeah, it was going to be attached to special forces. Forces um, got pulled off of that. Was meant to be coming with us then. Then got pulled off of that. And then, you know, without naming names, there were some people who came over with us that should not have been there. Yeah. Okay. And you know, he misses out. It's pretty, pretty shitty. So you had some issues getting your deployment. Is that right? Or, or was that the no. logo was just getting changed around? Or. Uh, yeah, on the lead up, so I did my pre-deployment training. We, so we did it in Townsville. Um, so I knew I was going, and then I did all my lead up training with, um, oh, I think it was Bravo Company. So we're like, I, I trained for how long was pre-deployment, Shane? Oh god, a couple of months yeah, in Townsville. Sure. And uh, so I did it with a, um, a certain platoon. I got used to our tactics and how everyone moved, and you know our drills basically. And then at the last minute, uh, some changes got made. And they said, all right, you're not going to be with them. You're going to be with these guys now. And by the way, they leave for Afghanistan in two weeks. When before that, I was going to leave in about six, seven weeks. I had all these um, plans with my ex-girlfriend at the t- oh, ex-girlfriend who, um, we, you know, we booked in holiday before we went to Afghanistan. <laughs> and then I had to ring her and say, hey, this is while I'm in Townsville. I'm like, hey. Um, Love you. I hope you enjoyed yeah. your day. Just, I've got to tell you something. Um, I'm not leaving in six, seven weeks. I'm leaving in two weeks now. So I can't go on that holiday with you. So I'll be back next week. We'll say our goodbyes and then I'm off. <laughs> Um, so that, that was tough because I hadn't trained with this group before. And the first time I'd really be, um, getting to know them is over in Afghanistan because we'd already finished all our field training and it was just the, the prep now to go overseas. So for me, it was a little bit daunting cause I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't really know where I fit in here or what mm. these guys are like. Mm. Uh, and then when I got overseas on the um, first nursery patrol that I was going to be leading, they're like, oh, yeah, that's, by the way, you're going to lead this nursery patrol now, which... was a nursery patrol? Sorry, it's like when you get into country over in Afghanistan, um, the guys that are leaving country um, will go out on patrol with the guys that are coming in, show them the ropes. Like an induction. Yeah, yeah, yeah basically yep. an induction. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically, an, yeah, well, I was doing an induction, and before the, the mission, they're like, oh, yeah, you'll be, um, you'll be the lead crew commander. So the vehicle out the front, I'll be in charge of the navigation and everything. Looking at my map, not seeing Afghanistan before, trying to figure it out. No oh, wow. And the guy that was um, meant to be helping me with my induction, he he was in the back of the car, basically sleeping. He's like, "Mate, any issues? I'll just be, I'll be down here because I'm standing, I'm standing out of the hatch of the bushmaster uh, with my map." And he's like, "I'll just be down here if you need me." Um, yeah, just just call out if you need anything. Just I'm like, look "Fake at, it till you make yeah, it." Yeah, I'm looking right? at my map, <laughs> looking at the terrain, going, "This doesn't make any sense at all." I'm like, yeah, and it was it was a nightmare that first one. So, but. God. I was on my deployment. I, you know, got to do what I trained to do. So uh, I was happy with that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so your first, when you get deployed, your boots on the ground. What's the environment like? What are your, what are your first thoughts? Um, so it's well, if you land, or oh, because the first thing you don't actually fly straight into into country. You first stop off at the um, UAE. Yeah. Um, United Arab, Arab Emirates um, at a Air Force base there, and you do a little like um, zero your weapons, make sure you you scopes and everything good like that. Some final um, first aid training, care of the battle casualty, things like that. Um, so that's a bit. Uh, I, it's more you just like pumped up, like just ready to go. Hurry up, let's do this, and because there's a lot of admin crap that has to go on in the background. Absolutely. So then, uh, when the day finally comes, you jump on your plane. You've got your weapon there. It's all getting pretty weir- real. Um, you're flying in. Um, Did you get the speech in the airport hangar before you left by that colonel? Oh, He's like, "You're part of history, ge- oh, gentlemen." Jesus Christ. Oh, you, you get really? that the General Patton speech. Oh, wow. you, get, you get the goosebumps. You're like, "Man, the pump is, up." Yeah, this is real. Yeah. Yep. So flying in. And I hate. I'm not. A, I don't like flying, but it was. Mm. It was frigging awesome. I don't. I because I don't do roller coasters either. Yep, but the um because you come you come in really high, obviously, so they can't target you with um rockets or anything like that. And um, what the, what they'll do is is they'll do that for as long as possible to the last safe moment, and then they'll just drop as quickly as possible to then land the plane. And they so it's just, can, can we just go back last safe moment? <laughs> Oh, None yeah. of that probably, sounds safe. Pro- the last safe moment was probably the Normanby. The <laughs> Sunday before we left, I think. Although the Normanby's not even that safe. Well, I got... Oh, no, it wasn't the Normanby. I think it was the other one. Play in? Yeah, I got kicked out of there. Yeah, that's three, right. Yeah. Three times in a row. That's the right. Same row. That. But anyway, um, so yeah, that's a bit... That was, for me anyway, it was really freaking exciting, which was weird because I don't like flying. But um, you finally land and like, yeah, you chomp at the bit, let's do this, let's do this. And then 
more admin. So yeah, righto guys, come into the hangar. Uh, we're gonna hit, hand you out your key, your room keys while you stay here at Town Care. Uh, here's some do's and don'ts, you know, like just more admin crap. <laughs> and that yep. just, yeah, so it's not until, I uh, know, be different for you because you start TK, but then it wasn't until we actually got on our nursery patrol, which was moving out to the Ford operating, operating base that uh, I was posted to, um, that it all kind of starts to get quite real. But even then, like the whole, uh, yeah, the whole time, I won't go into it, but um, it's weird how mundane it is. Like mm. the mixture of excitement with just the everyday munda mundanity of it all. It's, yeah. yeah, it's weird. Okay. So you're pumped, you're, you're really pumped up, but then it's just this constant like rising of um, adrenaline quickly brought back down by like, okay, guys, we've got to do this now, like some kind of paperwork or yeah, it's, it's weird. When did it finally happen when you get to go out of the wire, outside the wire? It's just... Well, for me, yeah, that was my first, uh, first time out of Tarrant Cow was driving to my Ford Patrol base. So yeah. then that was, oh God, however many kilometres... 10, 15, I, I think, something like that. Yeah, and I think my first time outside the wire was maybe day three, day two or three in country. Maybe yeah, probably probably day two. Um, and it feels like there's a lot to learn mm. straight away. And it's then, a lot of new sights, a lot of new sounds. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know you do all your training in Australia, so you're used to the Australian terrain, and yeah. we can mock up kind of what to expect. You know, we build villages and people role play, but when you get there. It looks completely different to what you're expecting. And there's a lot more people. A, yeah, a lot more people than you expect in the villages. And the terrain makes no sense. Like, you'll be in the middle of the desert for kilometres. There's no one there. Then a goat herder will be walking through the desert. And yeah, then wow. all of a sudden, you'll go down a dip and it'll be this lush greenery. Yeah. Wow. Drive into that for, like, 30 seconds and come out the other side and you're back in the desert again. Like, it's really strange. It's eh? yeah. bizarre. So yeah. it's like the... Uh, green zones just kind of snake or the river systems yeah. um, running through. So it's just these giant belts of green running through. It's incredible. It's really beautiful. Uh, that, yeah, yeah that, it's, that's one of the, the things that, uh, like I was saying on the, on the Hazard Ground podcast, <laughs> a lot of them say it's the most one of the most beautiful places in hell. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it'd be a great place if people weren't trying to kill you. Yeah, but yeah. basically, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Run us through a, a normal day. What are, what's, what are your duties? What is it just patrolling? Or? Uh, for, yeah, for me, I, like, I would have pretty busy days. So my job was basically to... Um, so first things first, you would have woken up, had a shower, I know where this is straight, straight to green beans. Yeah, yeah. So I had the base, <laughs> I was at Tarrant Cout, so it was, uh, I had quite a luxurious <laughs> place to stay. Uh, so yeah, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd go eat brekkie at the mess. <laughs> Uh, and then we'd normally have one or two jobs on that day. So for me, a job would be um, we'd be going out to a village um, for to take people to have a meeting or for engineers to look at a bridge or something to um, to basically help build infrastructure. And a lot of my role was essentially providing close protection uh, for those um, people on those jobs. Um, so I think in the end, we ended up uh, for the six month deployment, did just over two hundred and fifty. Of those so most days we had a job on uh, if we didn't have a job on um, then you're just sitting around with your mates either um, working on the vehicles cleaning your weapons going to the gym or watching movies that's wow. that's pretty much it a lot modern war is it's all about how much space you got in your hard drive yeah <laughs> and getting movies tv shows porn off each other and that's that's pretty much it <laughs> He didn't get any porn. No, 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 no. Shane didn't do that. No Shane didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were we were the same. It's like a lot of maintenance, making sure your gear is good to go. Um, yeah, again, like just it's so strange the mundane mundanity. I'm not even saying is that, that a word. That. Yeah, I'm not saying that right. It is now. Yeah, it is sure. Now. <laughs> uh, how mundane um, a lot of it actually is, um, and even when um, you go out on a patrol or to an Overwatch, you. Um, like you still do, you just do workouts and stuff. Just sit there, chill out. And yeah, it's not. Um, I don't know. It's... It just becomes so normal. Yeah. Like, when we look at our deployment, we we're like, well, we haven't we haven't really done what we were trained to do. You know, infantry soldier. You know, we train for 
the loudest fight, you know, that's what we want. And then yeah. modern war for us over there, it's, like you said, it's very mundane, like a lot of hurry up and wait, sitting around. Um, and that's that's basically it, you know. Like I watched Band of Brothers last week, and I was like, "Fuck, this wasn't my deployment." Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's complete. It's don't completely you different. No, nah, you don't want that deployment. You know, you don't want to be in the Battle of the Bulge. But like, yeah, most of the time, when I when I think back on my deployment, the most of the memories I have, uh, what we're talking about before the Brotherhood, the sitting around with the boys when you clean your weapons or kitten up or you know just sitting in an Overwatch position. Just talking shit, really. Mm. Yeah, that's it. Oh, like it's, it's some ra- there was some random stuff too. Like up the back, we had a um, uh, a half range setup where you could go and fire your weapon system, zero your weapon system, things like that. And I remember one day um, there was a bunch of goats caught up in the barbed wire right up the back, and we we're just up there trying to cut goats out of barbed wire. Um, oh God, what else? <sighs> I can't really think of anything else. Yeah, I know. Like, when we, now I mean, I'm saying it out loud, man, it was boring. <laughs> but it really wasn't, you know what I mean? Like, it's just because you, you have an expectation as an infantry soldier of what an Afghan, or, or what a war deployment is going to be. And it isn't that. It's something completely different. It's still an important job, obviously. But um, Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was going to bring that up, that it, it doesn't really matter what you're doing there. It's helping. Like it's, Yeah, yeah, that's right. You, it's all a part of it. Part of the big picture. You know. Yeah, but on the other side of the token, like you said, you train and it's like going to uni for four years to be a psychologist and yep. you end up flipping burgers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like it's, yeah, 100%. Um, I think the hardest thing for us is the deployments that happened before us. So 6RAR uh, had deployed in 2010 and that they lost a few guys and there were some big uh, contacts um, that happened on their deployment. So we compare, me and Shane compare our deployments to the ones that have happened before us, which is silly to do mm-hmm. because we don't feel like we've earned our medals or anything like that when we come home. So that that's kind of where we sit with it a little bit, hey? Yeah. Um, so n- n- neither of you saw combat at all? I did. <laughs> and he he yes. got rounds off. Yeah, so I, I was in... The closest I, I, sh- I shot some dude with a pen flare. <laughs> that's, that's about it, really. Yeah, so yeah. I, I was in... Um, oh, what One contact. I wouldn't call the first one a contact. It was... Uh, was this all on the same day? No, no. There's a, a couple of different days uh, spaced over a couple of... I think a month on two different um, times. We were at this uh, one patrol base where we were mentoring the Afghan National Army. Um, the first time that was pretty exciting. There was like a few rounds shot at us and, uh, yeah, I won't go into too much detail, but, uh, nothing really happened. Uh, but from, from the, <laughs> from the fire that was returned, you'd think it was like the biggest thing since Ben Hur, like oh. a bit, maybe a bit of <laughs> Every, everyone action. was just looking to get off rounds. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay. And then the, um, and then the second one, we were, uh, meant to be leaving that patrol base to move back to our patrol base. Um, and just as we were about to depart, we're all lined up, ready to go. The ANA or Afghan National Army Patrol uh, was coming back in. They started getting engaged from um, a small feature just across from the patrol base. So uh, we basically turned around, formed up and um, assaulted to provide them support while they came back in and yeah. Can you can you run us through the the whole process of it? like? Um, so, I guess, yeah, so we were at the back of the patrol base, uh, lined out, ready to move, oh God, north, northwest, I think it was, back to our patrol base. The A&A patrol was coming in from uh, the opposite direction, whatever that would be, <laughs> southeast. Yeah. Uh, and, um... <laughs> Good soldiering, mate. Yeah, thanks. If we use mill. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, we basically, yeah, did, did a turnaround, um formed up into um, like an extended, uh, extended line um, and just bounded forward in our vehicles, um, providing uh, covering fire as they came back in. Um, I think, so I don't, I don't really remember, it's so fuzzy in my mind, there's only a few things that really stand out, but uh, I think there was like a few, like, I don't think there was that many um, RPGs, but there's like some machine gun fire uh, targeting us. Um, but the only thing that really stands out in my mind is um, when I actually had to reload my weapon system. I had a, a 50 caliber machine gun, and um, 
Pulse. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, I love And you had thing. the uh, PWS? PWS, which is a, oh, God, I can't remember what it stands for, but essentially it's, it's like playing Call of Duty. Like, I've got a little TV screen inside the um, vehicle oh, wow. with a joystick, and I can control it all remotely wow. and zoom in and whatnot. Um, but um, so fire and array, fire and array, click, 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 and it takes you a second to go to run through your drills. You're like, oh, it's out of ammo. And, like, the best thing for me was just, this is my favourite moment. It was without even thinking, like, those drills are just so instinctual. Boom, like, lift the hatch up, fucking uh, feed tray up, and then, um, <laughs> no, I won't say that, but, yeah, someone's feeding me um, liners up, so just standing on top of this vehicle while rounds are coming <laughs> Anything in. Anything goes, man. Anything goes. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, because I'm, I'm still in, I've got to be a little bit careful about what okay. I say. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, like, but, yeah, standing on top of that vehicle with rounds coming in, that was, um, yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> what goes through your mind when you hear that first shot ring out and, and you think it's game on? Um, the first time it's just disbelief. You're like, was that? Was that what I? Because yeah, it was nowhere. Like, because we were at the back of the patrol base, so it was nowhere near us. It didn't land anywhere near us. But it's like, does, does that sound like gunfire? Like, what, what the hell is that? And all of a sudden, it's like, <laughs> oh, stand to, stand to. And then everyone's just running around like headless chooks. Um, the, it's a bit chaotic and a bit disorganised, especially when it's your first contact. Um, and you kind of just waiting for someone to grip the situation up and once that happens and the officers and the sergeants and uh, the section commanders do that um it all kind of just almost rolls into what your training was and you you just go through the motions of um what you were taught during your training um so you don't in the moment you don't have a lot of time uh to reflect ref reflect on what's happening at that time it's just yeah. very instinctual um but then afterwards uh once the adrenaline wears off um I don't know, even then I didn't really think about it that much. Uh, I was like, good times, go on. <laughs> I remember when you told me about it, when you come back into base, like, I got rounds off. And I'm like, oh, motherfucker, I haven't gotten rounds off yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, and, it, like, and the, one of the craziest things to me was after that, um, because there was a compound nearby, and it just really brought home how normal it was um, for the locals who lived there for gunfights and things to happen because with not even half an hour later after it was done and we were back at the patrol base there would have been about six or seven kids who just started playing soccer at the front of that compound like like it was nothing like nothing had gone on it was wow. yeah it was bizarre to see but they're tough little bastards well yeah they've been looking at war for well, god knows how decades, long decades yeah. Yeah. Like, decades yeah so it's just it's normal to them yeah, yeah. They grew up with it. Like, yeah. yeah. It's, Every it's, generation there has grown up with war. So Wow. Yeah. How does that make you feel when you see these kids running around? Like, I, I think... I remember know. it was the first time I saw how they were living and everything. I was... Yeah, it was, it was pretty sad because it is so... It's very primitive, you know, and they really have nothing. And you go to these small villages and... Yeah, they have nothing and like there's you basically if you're a male you grow up to what basically be a farmer essentially yeah. that's basically it and if you're a female you you have kids that's it and then you watch the you watch the kids and they're playing with rocks or <laughs> toys that you know or the forces that have come through give them you know um it is a bit different depending on where they are so like they like in some of the biggest cities there are universities and things yeah, yeah. And before um, oh God, I'm so bad with the history of it, but before I think it was the Mujahideen um, had gotten into power, um, it was a very, um, a lot more, I guess, maybe a liberal country where women were able to get mm -hmm. educated. They weren't required to wear um, the full face veils and things like that. But um, yeah, so it can be quite different like, depending on whether it's a city or if it's rural. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just remember the first time I saw yeah. the tiny villages. I was like, man, this is sad. Mm. But like I said, then, like, TK, Tarankout, the actual city, it's only a few kilometres from the nearest small, small village. Yeah. And they live a little bit differently. Yeah. And it's not even that far away. Yeah. yeah. But I think that that's probably one of the things that has affected, one of the things that's really affected me since coming back um, in terms of, like, how I want to live my life, um, thinking about, like, how... <laughs> I always call it like an existential crisis, like what's the point of everything or anything. Um, like seeing kind of how just how cold and unjust the universe is, like it 
if I was born there, I'd be mm. doing the same things they were. Like it's only because I got lucky and I was born in Australia that I got to be on that side of the conflict rather than, you know, potentially being bribed or um, uh, threatened into fighting for um, the Taliban or something like that. Um, so it, and especially with the kids, like I, for a long time, I really I didn't want to have kids. I didn't want to, um, I don't, <laughs> I'm always trying to like get rid of as much of my crap as possible and just trying to live with like as little stuff as possible. I hate having heaps of stuff around me and things like that. Yeah, that just really affected me a lot. Yeah. Uh, you were just like a minimalist sort of... Yeah, yeah. Like I just want to have like... I want to... <laughs> Madison gets the shits, but I just want to get a single 20-foot oh. shipping container and just live in that. I like... You still, yeah. Yeah. It, what Shane wants to start is a cult. <laughs> no, more tri- no more trinkets for Madison. No more trinkets. There's too much shit on the walls. <laughs> like, 100%. Kmart and... Stop buying furniture. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just get back to I guess. <clears throat> You've just seen how simple they live. Yeah, and yeah. I like it. Like, and I think people can be happier that way. But each to their own, whatever. But the, the, I, I totally agree. Like we we are built up in this society where everything that we have, all the technology that's been made, is been made to make our lives easier. Yeah, you know, and we just have so much of it that. If you go over there, what you see over there for them as this minimalist is normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's normal. Like, yeah. and we can't, we well, can't wrap your head around it. Like, yeah. how do they do with so little? Yeah, you know. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't imagine. A lot of them don't want change at all because that's like you said. That's, that's what they're life. used to. Yeah. yeah, they don't know what anything else would be. So when you're happy with what you have, why you, you don't need all this other stuff? So well, well, let's be honest. Like, I don't think Instagram or Facebook has made anyone any happier. Yeah, that's true. I agree. With <laughs> no, <that. laughs> no, no. Uh, actually, Casey Meredith uh, brought up a good point um, when him and Man Man Braid come over, and he said you can see these people on Instagram with their beautiful pictures, and he said they're mm. miserable underneath. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. In right. real life, you meet them and they're just yep. miserable people. Mm. Yep. No one's going to put up a picture of them being miserable, you know. It's no. going to be no. Uh, or if it is, it's going to have a filter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I could put a picture of me up crying, but you know, it's going to be in black and white. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's going to look yeah, good. Artistic. It's going to look good. Yeah. Hello, dark. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. So your deployments finish. You both come back over at the same time. Were you guys based together or? No, we were, um, how many times did we actually get to see each other Probably in like Afghanistan? Three times. Yeah, only three times where he'd come back to Tarrant out. They'd need a resupply or something. Mm. Um, so we were at yeah, completely different places um, when we were in country. Uh, and then I got back to Australia before Shane did by a couple of weeks, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Not that long, yeah. Um, I think I got back in November or late October. And then a few weeks later, Shane yeah. came back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wish I could remember the dates. But, yeah, we're like... And then as soon as he was back, yeah, we're straight back to hanging out all the time. Because, yeah, I felt like I didn't see you mm. at all that whole deployment. He's my best mate. I didn't even really get to see him just Aww. three times. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I whipped it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, how was your transition back into civilian life? Oh, Shane, you go first on oh, this one. Oh, God. Um, at first, it was... Um, it was exciting to be getting um, out of the army, like uh, perceived explosion of freedom, like not being able to grow a beard and not go to work every day and do whatever the hell you want. Like we still a little bit cashed up from, from our trip and, um, you know, there's just so much opportunity and freedom to go and do whatever the hell we wanted. So it was really exciting at the start. Uh, I think pretty much straight away, one of the first things we did was we did a trip over to Ireland yep. um, for a couple of weeks and Germany for a couple of days, but we ended up coming back home early because I uh, just didn't compare to Ireland. And we ran out of money. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Probably one of the main factors. Yeah, yeah big factor, yeah. Um, but then I think once the reality of like, oh shit, this money's running out, I've got to find some work, uh, once that starts setting in... Um, you kind of start going through a bit of, um, I don't know what you'd call it, because you're not seeing your best mates. Like, that's the beauty of the army is, like, you're going to work every day with your best mates. Um, and then all of a sudden, like, especially if you move away from 
um, where you were based, you're all of a sudden on your own. Um, you can't really, or oh, well, for me, I can't speak from my personal experience, but it was hard, hard for me to even talk to some of my best city friends, even just a normal conversation, because the shared lingo that we have and the way that we communicate and the and we have a lot of the same opinions on things. It, it, it's hard to do that with with even with your old city mates. Um, so yeah, it it takes it's um it starts to build up over time and. You can't really pinpoint one, like you're drinking more and, um, yeah. Was it, uh, was it a drink to forget sort of thing or was it a drink to remember or? Um, or was it I just... think at first it's just because you're bored. Um, I think for me it was like I've got nothing else to do, I'm bored. Um, so actually, you know what, I never actually thought about like drink to remember but it, because like I've always said, like I don't have. There's not a lot of things I'm, I remember trying to forget. Um, it's definitely a drink to uh, remember sometimes. Like when I just want to get written off and um, I guess wallow in my own self pity. It's yeah to remember things and to be able to be able to feel those things. Because uh, most of the time I don't ever think about it. I just push it down. Don't feel it. Don't worry about. it, Don't talk about it. Um, yeah. So it's like those those times. It's like and that's why it can end up being quite. Uh, <laughs> which is that classic mentality that we're trying to break people out of too. Isn't yeah, it? Like, yeah, hundred yeah, exactly. percent. And I've noticed, like, in the last few years, anytime me, Shane, and some of our other army mates get together when we do have a big drinking session, it it everyone gets a bit emotional and yeah. just wants to talk about the good old days, you know. And I, the next day, I hate it. I'm like, because I, I, I just feel depressed afterwards. Yeah, or even during as well. Like, I'm, I'm aware we're all doing it. And I'm like, this, we can't keep doing this every time we catch up is just drink and talk about the old days. You know, we're not, none of us are in, well, you're back in now, Yeah. but um, all the other boys are out and we all just talk about the good old days from, what, like eight years ago now. Six, you find that the same stories sort of crop up and, and you just think yeah. you're going, yeah. Yeah. going, just going through the motions. Yeah, yeah, yep. 100%. Yep. Yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Which is what, yeah, I guess, and that's what I started finding, I guess, recently is, um, with doing the podcast and even um, some of the civilian friends that I've started gravitating towards were ones who are like uh, self-starting and self-motivated who um, like one of my best mates, Flynn, he's um, basically taught himself how to do photography and now he's starting his own business with that and people like that because I'm uh, Sean Barry. Yep. Um, they, it's an opportunity to start creating new stories and um, have new experiences that are you know just as or if not more enjoyable and and whatnot instead of again like dwelling uh in the past and i think it was uh, jennings our old ceo of six R said uh when he was leaving like you you know be proud of what you've done overseas but don't live in the desert mm. like yeah. There's more. There's going to be yeah. more more things to do with your life than just the couple of months you spent in Afghanistan. So now it's about creating new memories. Yeah, yeah. With, the, with the same people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's right. And that's what a lot of guys struggle with is adjusting to civilian life, having that purpose. Because the military culture, you, you are living it. It's not just a job. It is your life. So mm. we would train, you know, normal hours Monday to Friday, and then after that, like when you'd finish you'd still be hanging around your mates. If you lived on base, like Shane lived on base, he was still in that environment. He'd walk into his room, there's army stuff everywhere. <laughs> You're talking to other army boys about yeah. what you did during the day or deployments and stuff like that. Or I lived off base and pretty much every second night, our group of mates would come around my house and, you know, someone would take a turn at cooking dinner, but we were still around the same group oh, of boys. Or I'd come around after work when you were doing your own PT and I'd um, I'd just buy, I was not doing that. I was not doing PT my own time. So I'd just buy a six pack, <laughs> oh, yeah, and watch pull up do, a chair and just watch, watch you do us, PT watch while I was sipping beer. <laughs> yeah. That's my man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, that is your culture. And if you just do your contract, which is four years, um, in the big picture, four years is nothing. Like that's a small part of your life but it becomes your whole identity. Like I've been a police officer for five years now, but in my heart, I'm still a soldier. Like wow. I, every day I still think about it. You know, there's not a day that's gone by that I don't think about it. So transitioning for me into civilian life, I while I was in, I applied for the coppers. Um, so I think by the time I was out of the army, I was only civilian that didn't have a job for five months maybe. And I was just living off my deployment money. And I, we were still getting paid by the army because... We were on leave oh, and we yeah, took yeah. all our leave. Um, and then I went straight into the police. So that was a successful transition to me be, for, for me because 
I still get to use similar skills. I'm still in a paramilitary organization. So I have a new identity. You know, I became a police officer. A lot of guys we know struggle with work because, you know, they either apply for the coppers and couldn't get in or they want to do private security or they want to be a personal Fire trainer. Is. Fire is. That's why you guys make it so bloody hard for civilians to get bodyguard jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah. mate. Oh, but, don't look at me. No, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, like, it's... Unless, unless you get out and realise that you need to find a new purpose, like, you, you're not a soldier anymore. You've got to leave that behind. And the guys who can't leave that behind, they're the ones that keep losing jobs and <clears throat> keep drinking and, just, you know, lose relationships because they just can't get over the old days. They've, you know, me and Shane, we're in a... Even though Shane's in the army now, he's a bit older, a bit wiser now, realises that you need... <laughs> you need other things in your life to make you a whole person, you know. It can't just yeah. be soldiering yeah. all the time. Um, you know, you need to branch out. And the same with me, like, even though I've gone to the coppers, um, I don't take on a police officer as my whole identity. You know, like, I see a lot of coppers that... They go live to part- They live it. They go to parties and all they want to talk about is work. You know, I'm like, fuck, oh, I can never Yeah, be so like then that. we all sit around and keep so, the crap out of it. So there I am, you know, writing a ticket. Like, Shut up, mate. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I had this one job the other day. No one wants to hear it, mate. Like, we're at a barbecue. Yeah, so you need to find another purpose and another identity. It can't just be yeah. that. Just because you do a job, it's not who you are. Yeah. And guys leaving the army need to realise that. While you're in... To be a successful soldier, I think you do need to take on that identity and you need to immerse you. yourself in it. Yeah, yeah, you do. But it's you know the army can train you to be an awesome soldier, but they just don't know how to untrain that out of you on the way out. Well, there's not much time put into it either. Like, how many months are you trained to be a soldier, and how you don't do you get trained to not be a soldier when you leave? Not well, when, well, when we got out, we didn't. It's interesting actually, and it always sounds like I'm trying to suck off my unit, but um. <laughs> I mean, like one, of your one, sex tape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's good. Um, so, uh, one of the things that our unit's doing is getting um, guys to do uh, PMEs, so professional. Um, oh no, what is it? Professional <laughs> military education. So, like, essentially, it's just a, a person will get tasked with um, coming out with the topic and then delivering a um, a speech or a. Yep. TED Talk. Yeah, kind of like a TED Talk. <laughs> on any, like, there's a list of topics that you can choose from or you can pick whatever you want. Um, like, yeah, and guys are really starting to run with that. And, like, it's interesting. Like, one guy did it on stoicism. Like, so... On what? Stoicism. Is like, that a word? Yeah, I don't philosophy. Like, what, oh, oh, right. It's like, yeah, it's like an ancient... Yeah. Yeah, right, Shane's right into it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it wasn't like to, me. How to be stoic. Yeah, how to be stoic. Right. Um, right. So, you know, and like we had a whole range of different things. Like some, one of the last ones we did was about DOHAS. So it's a scheme for people in the military, um, for the government to help uh, contribute to their uh, home loans and things like that and what you're entitled to. So it's like all kinds of different things, but it's like an opportunity for guys to do something outside of what we normally do and to develop yourself a bit more, Um, which I think is good because guys are starting to find more um, things to do outside of work, like there's a group of us at work who uh, all have bikes and we'll do, you know, a Sunday ride somewhere or something like that. And I think finding those things to do outside of work is is, is another really good way to help uh, find things to do when you are transitioning out. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, nice. And there's more and more uh, places to go now. Like, I mean, and, and a, lot, a lot more places that can help with that transition and yeah. kind of like warfighter coffee and yeah, yeah. yeah and yep. that sort of stuff. So um, for, for all those sort of people that want to um, bring forth job opportunities like um, what is it, Operator Edge? Uh, no, not Operator Edge. It's um, Extra Specialist. Yeah, yeah. Extra specialist, yeah. yeah. And there's a few Sean different Barry. places that um, – are starting to get on board more with that for finding not just veterans but um, emergency responders as well, finding them um, employment outside after they want to transition out. Um, but I think like the best advice is like take that time seriously and have a plan when you mm-hmm. get out. Um, because there's a lot of seminars and things that you know aren't mandatory, but you know you should go go to to find out what your options are. Um, you know any way that you can. What is it like transfer some of your skills into civilian qualifications, things like that? Just have a plan. 
And just checking yeah. check in on your mates, like just have yeah. that communication. Yeah. Because that is a hard thing, like Shane alluded to it before, is when you leave and become a civilian, you realise real quick, oh, shit, I don't see my mates. Yeah. Like, these are my brothers. I see them every day. And now I don't see them every day. And I, you don't realise how much you rely on each other until you're not catching up all the time. Yeah. Yeah. No. Do, you, do you think that the, what, what sort of uh, ideas can you give people to to deal with that and and sort of find another path as well? Like a, I think um, don't don't start a podcast that's ours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, don't do that. Um, I, I would say going back to what I was saying before, finding another purpose. Like you, <clears throat> you got to open your mind. Um, guys, we've worked with in the infantry, like. Like I said before, they're that engrossed in the culture. I don't want to talk to anyone that's not a soldier. You know, mm. this is the only oh, wow. stuff. I'll, you know, yeah. the only stuff I like talking about. It's like you need to, you need to realize that you can make other friends. They don't have to be soldiers. <laughs> there are that many people that have interesting things to say <laughs> uh, and do and talk about. Like if you enjoy playing sport, get back into playing sport again. You know, you'll meet people through that. You know, through whatever job you decide to do after, start being a bit social there and just reconnect with other people and try new things that's that's what i'd the advice i'd give to people yeah i mean we're still trying to find more um more places and people who are doing that um so i think we alluded to it last time we did a podcast but um i was told about a couple of places one near here in brisbane mm -hmm. one up near woodgate that are run by like old vietnam veterans where it's essentially a, a retreat for guys who've been in the defense force to go and they can go fishing or whatever on like these massive plots of land stay there camp there things like that have you guys heard of banks bankstown retreat is it bankstown no. there's a place out at lowood uh for emergency services and adf the, okay. for camping and stuff oh yep, okay yep. that might have been one of the ones he was talking about yeah that might be it banks creek retreat okay yeah. no i haven't heard of it Low, out low with this past yeah i'll get PSA. you onto it all yeah yeah, yeah that'd be good give you the link for the facebook page but um they have men's nights and, and women's yep. nights and all that sort of stuff and you could take your family out camping yeah that's probably one of the best ideas um mm. that i've come across um for being able for people to get together, men and women who have served, and especially it's good to see more and more emergency services being brought into the fold with Absolutely. the veterans mm. as well. It's really good. Um, What's well, yeah. one thing a lot I notice now is, yeah, there's, you know, we for years now you always hear about the mental health of soldiers and stuff like that, but yeah, now emergency services, mental health uh, is starting to be talked about a lot because I find, you know, I've done both. I've been a soldier and a police officer. I'm not good at either. But. Yeah, I'm not good at either, but hey, they keep paying me. <laughs> <laughs> but they, like, I've experienced more stress as a police officer than I ever did as a soldier. And, you know, you factor in uh, the adrenaline dump as a first responder, uh, the rosters you work, you know, the shift work that's constantly changing, the unknowns of every job you're going to. Yeah, you're going to have some mental health issues probably. You know, you're going to be a little bit stressed out. Mm. So, yeah, it's good that... Um, mental health in emergency services is starting to be recognised a lot more and get out there. Yep. There's some really good places out there for to, to help them as well. Yep. Um, I heard of a new one called Sirens of Silence. Oh, okay. Uh, they're based in Western Australia, but they're for emergency services yep. uh, personnel. It's a, uh, they offer counselling uh, separate to the employer counselling. Yep. Um, okay, yep. So that they the people don't have that fear of that's a really good idea mm. yeah because yeah. i know like heaps of coppers do fear fear the internal yeah. you know, system you know what what's in place and talking to anyone there um yeah i, I know a lot of people like to outsource who they talk to yeah. as well yeah. yeah absolutely so i think it's a great idea yeah uh because then they can get the help that they really need and still be employed yeah, yeah still be right. making money so yeah. for you how does the military compared to police work? Mm, that's a good question. Um, what What's good about the the police is I'm doing my job every day. So I'm always using the skills that I was trained to use. Would you say that because you didn't get your game day in the military, yep. do you think you're living that and making up for that somewhat? Or do you feel that you've uh, that your training is rightfully purposed, like you, you're actually fulfilling? Uh, oh, hell yeah, asking some good questions, <laughs> mate. Uh, 
Yeah, I think you've. Hang on, mate. I think I'm probably trying to make up. I didn't get my big game day. Um, you definitely were. Like, you're more conscious of it now. But yeah. You were you for ages. That's you were just chasing. Yeah, and I I do that in my job now. Like any urgent jobs, uh, you know, where there's some, a critical incident, a violent person, a stolen car, robbery, whatever. I'm chasing, I'm first to go, yep, I'm going straight there and trying to get wherever the action is, I'm trying to get involved with it. And yeah, I think it is because, you know, I did not miss my game day in the army and that's, I'm constantly chasing it. And like Shane said, I'm very aware that I do that. <laughs> but that's where I feel my skills, uh, my best skills are at critical jobs like that. I have the training with military um, and the police training. I feel I'm best suited to those kind of jobs. That's what I'm always going to be gravitated towards. Yeah. Mm. The word hero gets thrown around a lot. Ooh. <laughs> Not for me, though. <laughs> no. That's, that's, that's you. I get your text, mate. You, 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 <laughs> stop calling me a hero, Shane. Come on, mate. <laughs> um, <laughs> it threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're hard to work with. Yeah, we're, we're very hard to work with. <laughs> I'm, I'm slowly learning. <laughs> <laughs> so much regret. <laughs> <laughs> For you, Shane, what was it that made you want to get back into the military? Um, another good question. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I guess I'd reached the point, so... When I when I left, uh, my my goal was to join the fireys. Um, did not have a solid plan on how that was going to happen. I just decided, hey, look, this will work. Um, so it wasn't until I actually got out that I realised just how difficult and long a process that can be. Um, so eventually, I got uh, a job as a, a auxiliary, like part time fiery out at Gundawindi. Um and while that kind of started. Um, satiating a bit of that desire to do something a bit um, uh, dangerous um, and like give back a little bit. Uh, it wasn't quite the same thing. The more I thought about it, um, the more I realized like I was just going to be sitting around just as much. Um, concurrently to that, like I was having a lot of issues with alcohol, missing all my mates, so like, living so far away. And um, I think it was just, it just got to a point where it's like, if I don't go back to the army, I'm probably going to end up doing something silly to myself. And um, I just need to get back around people that I understood because I was having a lot of dramas with interacting with um, civilian friends and family and stuff like that as well. Was that also maybe so that you had that regimented uh, lifestyle again so it would sort of break you out of that sort of trend or...? Yeah, probably to a degree, um, and it definitely did that um, for a short amount of time. Like once I did get back in, um, and I got back into that lifestyle, I yeah, I did. I snapped out of it for quite a while, but then within I think it was about a year, um, it just went back downhill again, um, and that's when I really noticed it starts to actually affect um, my work and actually start actively seeking help. Um, do you remember what triggered that? I don't think there was anything that necessarily triggered it. Like, I was involved in the incident when um, uh, Red died uh, from um, Second 14, the cavalry um, soldier uh, in um, Shoalwater Bay. I think it was 2016. Yeah, you never told me that, that you were involved really? in that. Yeah, you didn't tell me that. Yeah, so um, we because I was involved in that incident... Um, they, anyone who's involved has to go and do, um, like a psych screening just to make sure everything's kosher, everything's going well. Well, I wasn't having any dramas with that or anything. Um, but in the back of my mind, I knew there was something else that wasn't quite right. So I just brought that up with the psychs and started talking to them about that. Um, I think it was, it, what finally broke the camel's back as it were, was I was just so sick of feeling like that all the time. Um, of getting really low and like I just I figure I can't keep living like this like I've got to find a way to to fix it otherwise yeah I can just drink myself to death <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well I mean it's um it, it's good that you saw the signs and 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 made the decision that something had to change yeah um been there done that mm. um but uh a lot of people don't have that 
response or that they don't have that um that moment yeah mm. where and they, and they just sink deeper and deeper yeah so i mean even even that what that wasn't that wasn't even my lowest point you know what i mean like it was still another year and a half before i even started getting proper proper help and kind of reached at my lowest point um there's always the possibility to <laughs> to best it <laughs> to the best it but um <laughs> yeah it's it's quite hard and i think what ha what helped me with that was um as as we go further down this road as as human beings and especially in the military and more becoming more so in the emergency services as well um the culture of being able to talk about it grows you i you feel a bit more comfortable going and seeking seeking help and um for, for the for the Army, there's uh, or for the defence, there's um, VBCS, Veterans. Um, what, what does it stand for? Vietnam? No, Veterans Counseling Service. What are the other V stands for? I can't remember. Um, but same thing, where you can go and talk to um, psychologists and uh, psychiatrists outside of the scope of the army. And unless you're going to kill yourself or hurt someone else, um, they're not going to report anything to the army. So you can still kind of carry on with your um, with your career in that way. Um, so having those. I guess, what would you call it, facilities and um, people to talk to kind of outside of the army really made it a lot easier to actually want to go and seek that help. Yeah. Yep. Where would you recommend people start? With, the, with Veterans Affairs or? Uh, it's called something else now. God, I'm so bad with names. I can't remember it either. Yeah. yeah something hope or some of that um, is a good place to start because it's outside of your chain of command. Um, you know, they're not going to report to the army, obviously, unless you are going to hurt yourself or someone else. Um, even a mate is a really good place to start. Let someone else know. If no one else knows what you're going through, no one can help you. Um, just by talking to someone else, you might be able to sort it out that way. Um, yeah, I think you just you got to talk about it. That's well, the only way that's it's. I think get once better. we all may have realised this that where we started to really um, pick up and get better is once you have an understanding of what's what's going on with yourself and why you are the way you are. That's when you can learn how to treat it and handle it. Mm -hmm. You know, and like we've realised because well, for years we were going through ups and downs, mm -hmm. and once you and me started talking to each other about it and figuring out our issues laid with you know basically an identity issue um leaving the army obviously shane got back in me like i said before i will always associate with being a soldier which is it will always be a bit of an issue but for me those that's where i feel my best parts are but it's still an issue that i i feel like that once you have an understanding and start talking about it you like every time you talk about it you can talk about it a thousand times within a week you will you will get something out of it and yeah. realize something new about yourself and slowly once you start picking up these little clues and start putting the puzzle back together mm. you do feel better and i think that's as long as people are talking about it like shane said either to a professional or to some mates then yeah then that's a good place to start and to be honest i have gotten a lot out of therapy um but you know the thing that probably saved my life was talking to tommy and like there were a couple of days when you know i was I had a plan for how I was going to kill myself and it was only because, you know, Tommy, luckily Tommy called me or I, I, you know, just was over and I called him and we were able to talk through it that, you know, it just, you know, it went from like, oh, I'm going to kill myself today to, oh, you know what, well, it's not so bad. Like, I think yeah. that one day um, after I'd, I talked all the way home, it's about 30 k's home from work for me. And I was talking That's to Tommy. a long time to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <sighs> so I was talking to... I was, talking to Tommy and by the time I got got to the shop started to get stuff for dinner I was like oh you know what you know life's pretty good like it's it's all right and then like normally I, I can't stand pop music and stuff and <laughs> they had this song playing in the in the in the thing normally like just ranting and raving against the world and this woman was whistling oh you know what? that's nice you know she's whistling while she works oh this is lovely <laughs> which is a big thing for Shane because he's the most cynical person yeah. I've ever met if someone's happy he's like what are you happy about don't be happy so that's a big thing for him to like pop music or let someone whistle yeah <laughs> but wow. yeah like 100 it went from yeah i'm gonna go park in that quarry and gas myself mm. but yeah um so yeah like something as simple as just talking to a mate will really can really help yeah, like I've I've come across people, even just a guy in the pub, come up to me one night and said that his son was 
sitting in hospital dying oh and shit. i'm like fuck and he and he goes can i have a hug and i said fuck yeah you can have a hug yeah and and the first thing i said to him was build yourself a support network yeah um don't rely just on one person yeah uh, there was uh, a friend of mine who had two friends one of them committed suicide and the other one uh tried calling her one night and um she didn't answer the phone and then he killed himself oh. Oh, and it's like because i think he was relying on that one person yeah. all the time and as yeah. soon as that help didn't come through that was the tipping point yeah uh so it can be exhausting for the person that you're telling as well oh yeah, yeah. just remember that yeah, so, yeah oh yeah um build build yourself a support network and, and get multiple people on board so that you can you you got contingency plans yeah to yeah. fall back on yeah. so. actually that's a really good point i think uh what stops a lot of people from talking sometimes is they do have that one or two people that they go to when they feel bad and they start to feel a little bit of guilt like they may be going through a tough time and someone will reach out like how you know how are you feeling today and they don't want to tell them because they feel like oh, i'm just going to bring this person down mm. and i don't want to do yeah. that to that person so they'll just keep it all internal that's right you know because they've only got that one person they talk to yeah yeah and but it, like I said, it can be encompassing for the the, the recipient of that information mm. as well. Time like, mm. and it's not to say that they're sick of hearing it. It's just they start to live it themselves. Like it's yeah. um, you know, and for that person, like there's only there's only so much you can say. Yeah, you know, and they may feel like they're repeating themselves over and over again, uh, which you know is fine. But um, yeah, they may may think, oh, am I even really helping this person? It is draining. Yeah, you know, to that person, I see it all the time. Yeah. You know, with uh, mental health jobs that I go to, where they're relying on you know a family member, and I talk to the family member, and they're like, I don't know what else to do. You mm. know, this is what I've done, this is what I've told them. I, I'm at my wit's end basically with how to help them. You know, so it's draining for everyone. Yeah, but you know, you got to do what you got to do to help them through it. Yep. Yeah. Well. Okay. So, where do you see yourself going in the military? Um, RSMA. Explain that, mate. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Don't just say so, that. Uh, That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> case closed. <laughs> see, you, see you later. <laughs> no, okay. RSMA is like the, what, what do you call it? Like the regimental sergeant major of the army. So it's like one under the big, big dog. Uh, no, I'm joking. I'm not I was going to say, that. what? When did you get ambition? <laughs> oh. I was like, um, when were you going to tell me? <laughs> I was getting no. really excited there. No, no, no. Um, like I love the uh, job I'm in now as a combat engineer. Um, I'll probably keep doing this job as long as my body will let me. Um, yeah, I, I don't really want to get out again at the moment. Um, I just love more so now because I love the work that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, than at it being my life raft <laughs> as it was when I got back in. But um, I think yeah, I'll try and ride. Um, yeah, so as long, as long as my body will hold out, I'll try and keep doing this job and then I suppose uh, try and get my commune started, just buy some land somewhere and then... Uh, Your cult, mate. Call it a cult. It, That's yeah, what it it's is. a commune. Come on. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I really just want to just go bush, eh? Yeah. <laughs> and just be away from everyone. Off-grid. Yeah, 100%. That's how we want to awesome. live off in, Tas yeah. in Tasmania. And he wants everyone to come with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, just share the costs around. I'm right? in. I'm in. Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> I could live out in the middle of the sticks. No, yeah, I know, <laughs> man, it'd be yeah. so much fun. Yeah, hundred yeah. um, percent. But yeah, like I don't know. I can't. I really can't beat my job at the moment. Like at the moment, I'm allowed to touch explosives. But you know, when you get to, I used to dream as a kid about setting off fireworks and explosions and shit. Now I get to do that. Like mm. for a job, it's it's pretty fucking. Awesome. Yeah, family friend of mine is an engineer in New Zealand Army. And he told me a story once of how they blew up a tractor, and I was like, yeah, "Yes, cool. yeah, <laughs> that's very cool." Yes, it, you get to blow some cool shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about yourself, Tommy? Mate, um, at the moment I'm enjoying just being in first response. You know, the unknown of it all. Um, I do have I have plans. I won't go into what the plans are, no, but no, I'm work, right. I'm working on some things and getting into like a specialist role. <laughs> Bit of a mover and shaker, I Bit of a mover and shaker, mate. You know me, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like, I, I enjoy, I've been a police officer for five years now, um, and yeah, I'm still enjoying, yeah, the first response aspect of it. So, yeah, I'll just keep doing this and um, just keep the grind going until I get where I want to be. But um, I love my job. 
Hundred percent. Can I ask if it's more of a tactical role? It is more of a tactical yeah, it's role. Yes, not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's where it would have yep, ended. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I'll say. But yeah, that's what I have to get into. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah, awesome. <laughs> Well, guys, it's been absolutely fantastic to have you in here. Yeah, mate, Likewise. Yeah, it's been awesome. It's been, um, yeah, really rewarding to hear firsthand what, um, because you're pretty much my first deployed military guys that oh, I've wow. had in here. So um, I'm just hoping that more will jump on board. So if anyone has a, a really interesting story or want to talk about their time uh, in, in the service, whether it be military or uh, ems workers please don't hesitate to contact me at the um, at man k4301 at gmail.com tommy and shane and of course the lovely miss shane <laughs> uh, thank you for coming in and i wish you all the best in the future cheers mate thanks mate same thank to you. you thank you we're out fuck yeah guys thank you very much for joining me on this podcast i do want to give a bit of a shout out to uh tommy and shane thank you guys very much for coming on it has been an absolutely fantastic episode um love to have you guys back i also want to give a shout out to a work colleague of mine uh, his name is jutton um he kindly gifted me the two microphones that tommy and shane were using tonight absolutely fantastic audio uh i just need to learn how to use them a little bit better <laughs> with my mixing but uh thank you Dutton, so much for for your donation to the man cave um they will go to good use as you can see and yeah i cannot wait to get more people on the other end of them thank you very much until next time peace out